Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful day already, and I'm thrilled to be here to talk to you about kibbutzing your hood. And I want to begin with a question. If you could design utopia, the good place, the ideal city, the perfect neighborhood, what might it look like? How would you arrange its streets and its buildings to connect the people who live there? So just think about that for a second while I take you on a tour of a place where I once lived. Uh, an experiment in utopia. Okay, and we'll begin from high above because I think you can see the values of any community uh, best from outer space, uh, or at least from uh, Google Earth. So uh, how is this utopia designed? Well, you begin with a circular ring road to keep cars to the periphery. You add a work district for farm buildings, factories, and offices. You arrange houses and apartments in concentric circles. You add a daycare, a retirement home, a cultural center, maybe a library, a pub, and a coffee shop to bring people together. You center everything around an open grassy area and a communal dining hall for eating, meeting, and public celebrations. This common hub is fed by a network of walking paths like the spokes on a wheel. The center is never more than 15 minutes stroll away. Well, when I tell people that at the age of 20, I ran away from a broken heart to go live on a commune in Israel, they sometimes say, oh, uh, you went kibitzing. You lived on a kibitz. You're, you're a kibitznik. I have to correct them. No, no, no. It's a kibbutz with a U. It's, it's a different thing. <laughs> and, and yet there's an accidental truth in that confusion. See, kibitz comes from a Yiddish word from a German root that means to be an annoying observer at a card game. <laughs> and it's, it's since evolved to mean simply casual gossip, chit chat, shooting the breeze. Kibbutz, on the other hand, refers to a communal settlement in Israel, collectively owned by its members and organized on cooperative principles. And in the beginning, kibbutzniks shared absolutely everything, their property, their profits, their decisions, raising their kids, even the clothes on their back. There are still 270 kibbutzes in the country. And it, uh, the word itself comes from the Hebrew for a gathering. And it contains that same sense of being both a noun and a verb. And I think it's an important reminder that community is as much an action as it is an area code. It's the pattern of behavior that any place either encourages or discourages. It's a conversation. To be part of a community is to kibitz. And yet true kibitzing can only occur on a human scale at a human pace. It is quite literally a pedestrian activity. We walk and we talk. Those are our two most fundamental traits as a, a savanna species, as an upright ape with language. And yet, I think we've uh, lost some of that power of positive gossip in our own communities. We know more about the intimate lives of reality TV celebrities than we do about our next door neighbors. I think the genius of the kibbutz was in trying to design a neighborhood that would enhance positive gossip, that would encourage walking and talking, that would create its own slow foot movement. Now, utopia has never come out of uh, thin air. In the 19th century especially, there were dozens upon dozens of ideas for the perfect society. And uh, some of them were serious, and a lot of them were pretty loopy. Uh, one, of the, the, one of the most influential, though, oh, was the Garden City by English social reformer Ebenezer Howard. And the Garden City went on to, to inspire both the Israeli kibbutz and the North American suburb. And yet from the same blueprint, the, the kibbutz and the suburb took very, very different paths. In Levington, New York, for instance, the original suburb was built to serve the needs of cars and commuters and has led to our current epidemic of urban sprawl. And yet even in Levittin, the developers there were originally concerned with promoting positive gossip. And they actually banned fences from the original neighborhoods, so parents and kids alike could wander freely and get to know each other. Didn't last, of course. Homeowners demanded their privacy and either 
uh, overlooked or overturned those laws. Future subdivisions were built with boxed-in backyards as a selling point. Suburbia turned its back on its neighbors. And if you think about it, open spaces can have powerful, unforeseen social effects. And I'll just give you a quick personal story. When my family moved into our new house, uh, the backyard had a hot tub, but no side fence. Maybe the old owner was an exhibitionist, I don't know. Uh, the natural thing to do would be keep the tub out of fence. Well, we ended up doing the opposite. Got rid of the tub, left the yard open. A funny thing happened. We got to know our neighbors. As soon as my son was born, he was crawling across the invisible property line and inspecting their strawberry patch. Before long, our neighbor took him under her wing and, and taught him how to garden, gave him seedlings so he could plant his own patch. For his first kindergarten show and tell this year, he brought in kale and string beans that he had learned how to grow. She became his friend, his green thumb mentor, his shirt tail aunt. He's as close to her as he is to any of his blood relations. And none of that would have happened if a fence had stood between them. Now, I grew up in, in a classic, classic North American suburb, one of those developments, you know, it's built on a swamp and then given street names like Clearwater and, and Kodiak. <laughs> I joke, it was, it was a nice enough place to be a kid, but I, I returned there uh, not long after living on the kibbutz and, and went wandering through my old hood. It was a summer afternoon and school was out, but there wasn't much activity. Anybody who had a job had to get in their car and drive into the city to do it. Everybody else seemed to be locked in their house or their backyard. There was no street life, no porch life. I mean, the empty sidewalks felt like the day after the zombie apocalypse. And I must have looked a little bit lost or lonely because as I was cutting across uh, a corner of lawn, I heard this voice call out to me from the dark, from, from behind the shadows of a screen door. And this is what it had to say to me. Get off the grass! <laughs> that, that was it. That was my one human interaction that day. I think that's an example of what bad design can do to a community. And it, it got me thinking years later that you could calculate the health of any neighborhood by its KQ, its kibitz quotient. The amount of positive gossip that occurs in a walk through its streets. So if you think of M as the number of meetings you have with friends or strangers, and see the, the, the conversations or acts of cooperation that result, then K equals MC squared. <laughs> and I think that day my KQ was less than zero. One of the unique things about the kibbutz was its absolute obsession with maintaining and enhancing its KQ to almost absurd degrees in every decision and design change, and no more so in the infamous battle of the tea kettle. Now, on the early kibbutz, they could only afford a single kettle, which they kept in the dining hall or maybe the members' lounge. If you wanted a hot drink, you left your room, you walked over there, you probably bumped into somebody, you had a chat. Well, eventually, members wanted kettles in their own rooms. Huge debate ensued. How would this affect the social fabric of their community? Uh, ultimately, they decided, okay, well, private tea kettles probably wouldn't spell the end of the kibbutz. And they had the same debate over each new technology, phones, radios, TVs. It seems absolutely insane to us now, except maybe they had a point, at least if you consider the tea kettle a metaphor for what sociologist Ray Oldenburg has called our third places. What's a third place? Well, it's, it's neither home nor work. It's an in-between place. It's a gathering place. It's a place like a coffee house or a pub, a hair salon, a barber shop, a library, a bookstore. It's a place that serves that need for human communion and becomes a center of informal public life. I think the parable of the tea kettle is a reminder that we have to protect those third places that already exist in our neighborhoods create new third places to draw us away from the gravity of private life and into public conversation, and demand those flexible zoning laws so that our work life, our home life, and our social life aren't kept so separate. We can't afford to lose 
the battle of the tea kettle in our own backyards. What, what, what's the point of all of this kibitzing? I mean, where does, it, where does it ultimately lead? Well, I think gossip is good when it allows us to tell a story about our community, when that story can be transformed into myth. Uh, and the kibbutz was very, very good at this. As one historian noted, the early pioneers created a series of legends and myths that gave them strength in their present and confidence in their future. They named their communities. They preserved their collective memory and story and song, archives and public celebrations. They shared their common values through newspapers, journals, bulletin boards, closed circuit TV. These myths sustained the kibbutz movement for 100 years, a remarkable achievement. I think we can uh, tap into that same power of collective identity by using the new tools of micromedia, of desktop publishing and, and social networking. And I was reminded of this when I was living in, in uh, a corner of Toronto, an otherwise unremarkable uh, district of the city. It was kind of hemmed in by a busy road, a subway yard, and a train track. And yet, neighbors there had turned this physical circumstance to their advantage and renamed it The Pocket. And they'd created a newspaper and an online forum to tell the stories of The Pocket, its history, its culture, its ecology, its characters. Uh, a sense of identity developed around a micro-neighborhood that didn't exist on any official map. The myth of The Pocket grew, and with this myth, it brought neighbors together. Now, the original kibbutz pioneers always believed that utopia could be more than a work of fiction. They dreamed of creating a new society based on absolute equality. They even imagined that the entire world would be so inspired that we'd all turn into one giant kibbutz living in peace and harmony. Now, I don't know if you've read a newspaper recently but that hasn't exactly happened. The kibbutz wanted to change the world. Instead, the world changed the kibbutz. That tends to be the story of utopia. In fact, over the last 10 years, many of these socialist communes have privatized and abandoned some of their original ideals. And yet, I think the kibbutz, and especially its architecture of hope, can uh, help us evolve our communities into their next stage of development. And I think their most important lesson is this. Be bold. Give your own micro-neighborhoods a name and even a newspaper to broadcast their myth. Turn them from an area code into a gathering, into a kibbutz. We might not build utopia overnight, but we can cultivate our own small good places. One less fence and one more story at a time. Well, now, in, in the democratic spirit of, of these communities, I actually want to hear your ideas for uh, improving your KQ. So once again, I want you to stand up. Please stand up. I want you to uh, take each other by the hand. I want you to really connect. Like the circle dance, like the circle dance that marked the beginning of each new community. That's beautiful. Look at this. And on the count of three, on the count of three, I just want you to turn to each of your neighbors and share one small, simple, easy idea for kibbutzing your own hood. So let our conversation begin in three, two, one, go.